Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to another live session with Tech Immigrants. I'm your host, Sahar. Today we have a special guest, Maria Petrova, a VP of product at TWICE. Maria moved from Russia to Finland five years ago and has been doing amazing things in tech work ever since. Maria, a big thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having and inviting me. Super happy to share my experience with the community. Thank you so much. I'm also super excited to hear that. So could you please introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, so professional side of myself is a product person. I've been working in product management for the last 10 years. As you already said, I moved uh, from Russia to Finland five years ago. And since then, I've been working in the Finnish tech scene uh, with startups and scale-ups. I've been working at Smartly as my first employment here in Finland, then moved to Zelanda, spent some time in a scale-up called Supermetrics. And now I decided to move again and work for the green tech company called Twice. The company is based in Munich, but I'm still working from Helsinki right now. So yeah, I can share some experience about how you can work in an international environment and also how you can move between these whole different tech companies. Nice. Yeah, that was my first question. I was really curious to know how you are based in Helsinki, but you're working for a German-based company. How is it possible? Yeah, I think we all should thank Corona a little bit. It's not that much <laughs> we can thank Corona for, but one thing is that companies nowadays are more of open to introduce remote or hybrid model of working. That means that everyone has access to more opportunities in terms of job. And that's how I ended up working for a German company. They've been looking for someone with my skill set. And they were quite open to hire anywhere in Europe. And yeah, I really appreciate that I was given a chance to actually stay where I am right now, because this is where my family stays. And it's really hard to move your family uh, between countries and cities and then can still do my work. Nice. But then I have a question about the taxing. So you are taxing in Finland or in Germany? In Finland. In Finland. Oh, okay. Nice. You, you, if, if you live in Finland, <laughs> you reside in Finland, you need to pay taxes in Finland. But you can still work for many companies from Europe. There are like multiple models how this can be implemented. Let's not go into this legal aspect. If someone is interested, please ping me on LinkedIn. I can share the details. Just don't want to bore everyone with details. But... Right now, the companies like remote.com, for example, enable a lot of opportunities for companies to hire internationally. That increases access to the talent for the companies, and it also increases access to the opportunities for whoever is looking for a job. And I think that's great. Awesome. So what motivated your move from Russia to Finland? I really wanted to try myself and challenge myself to work in an international environment. And Finland, if we compare Finland and Russia, Finland is way more integrated into the whole global international market, into international systems. I wanted to work in English, not in Russian. And this was the major motivation from like a career and ambition standpoint for me to move. And yeah, Smartly is an amazing company. And I'm super, super happy that they have given me an opportunity to join them five years ago. Awesome. Okay, and also a reminder to all our viewers, remember you can post your question for Maria in the live chat. We will dedicate some time later to address them, so to make sure to get involved. Okay, now my next question is about building self-confidence. So many newcomers sometimes struggle with lack of self-confidence due to various challenges. So can you share some experience, a moment that truly inspired you to push forward in your career? Oh, that's an interesting question. And I think like it requires a lot of self-reflection to remember. Let's probably start with the self-confidence. And this is something that doesn't come easy because when you move countries, you usually move uh, environment in terms of communication practices, what considered good, what considered bad, even like tone of voice that people use in different cultures is a little bit different. And it all can undermine your confidence in a way that you don't know how to communicate anymore so i would say that give it a time make sure that you listen a lot first 
and then you try to adapt to the ways people around you talk. And you, the most important part is assume the best intention, because whenever you are in an environment that is uncommon to you, you start like it's the way our brain functions, right? If you've read all these neuroscience related books, you know that we evolutionarily developed as animals to anticipate danger. So if the environment is unfamiliar, you start perceive it as an aggressive environment. And then you immediately think about how to, can I respond to this aggressive environment? But you need to assume that people around you are actually happy to help. They hired you for a reason because you have some skills that you have some um, interesting things that you can bring to a job, right? And then they assume the right intention, assume that they're here to support. Even if sometimes for you, it doesn't sound familiar, it doesn't sound right. It is just the new environment. It doesn't mean that it is not friendly. It doesn't mean that the people are here to hurt you or undermine you in any way. Just assume the right intention. And then if something is super unclear for you, it's okay to ask questions like, hey, I don't think I understood everything in that meeting. Can you clarify? Don't be afraid to ask for help. It actually uh, shows that you're a powerful and self-aware person rather than that you're a person who like weak or doesn't know anything. So be prepared that you might seem like naturally by the way your brain operates, you might uh, consider that the environment around you is unfriendly. That's not true. That's your perception. And try to assume the right, the best intention for the rest in, in your organization or in the environment that you're working in. Thank you so much, Maria. Okay. And my next question is about, so you already have a lot of experience working in multinational companies. So it means that you are now learning different communication style. So yeah. what is your strategies or tips do you can share about effective communication in such diverse setting? Yeah, I've already started with, my, with, with the previous question that we discussed. I already started to kind of explain that the best thing you can do is always assume that people mean well and then trying to clarify it. And you also need to understand that there are different ways for people to communicate and some feel really comfortable to speak up and some feel really mm -hmm. comfortable to write things down. And some people, I don't know, like the international language of pictures more. And whenever you are trying to communicate in a multicultural environment, I would say you need to use as many ways to communicate with different people as possible. So let's say you are handling a workshop and you have people of different backgrounds. Make sure that it's not only people who are the loudest get a stage, but you also have some exercises when people can just write things down or bring some pictures. And sometimes when you find that there is a misunderstanding that because happens because people define things differently for themselves. Like I know like if someone from my team watches it right now, they will be like, yeah, Maria is going to uh, make this joke again. I have this example of a pink elephant. If I tell you, imagine a pink elephant, and then I will ask you to draw it, everyone will draw a different pink elephant. <laughs> right? Even though it will be an elephant and it will be pink, but it will look very different. So sometimes people run in a conflict because they just have a different definition for the same thing. And it's really important to enable them and also be prepared to listen to them multiple times to understand what exactly do they mean when they tell something, like, I don't know, describe something. And whenever you go from like a very determined numbers level to an abstract level, the problem becomes bigger and bigger. So be prepared to listen a lot and clarify a lot and don't be afraid to ask any questions. Mm, yeah, actually, like I'm just reflecting on my own experience. I, especially in the beginning, I was really afraid to ask questions because I was afraid that they feel that I'm not skillful and they hire the wrong person. That was, I, that's why I was always avoiding and push back. Okay, I will figure out things by myself and I have to spend many hours to just do the discovery. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, but what is your advice for some people like, like me, that in the beginning of their career, they are very afraid to ask questions because they are worried that how people, they will judge them. Yeah, uh, and I think that's a really, really common uh, situation, right? And I think I've been there myself as well because, oh, what is it if it is a silly question? 
but then you might figure out that there is one person in the group that you feel super comfortable to speak with and start small, start asking questions from this person, give them a heads up like, hey, you know, I'm confused so many times, I was confused so many times this week, maybe I can, you can help me and I can ask you questions and then start with this person and then you kind of form this habit that it's okay to go for uh, for help and it's okay to ask more questions. To be honest, sometimes uh, mm, it might lead to a very, very bad situation when you assume. The more you assume, the bigger the cost of error becomes, right? Because whenever you ask a question, you actually clarify and your next step is de defined by the good answer. But if you just keep it to yourself, you accumulate and accumulate and accumulate these assumptions on top. So it might even hurt. And yeah, yeah, so you need to encourage yourself to ask questions. And to be honest, like I've been a people leader for a really long time and I haven't seen ever that someone was fired for asking a question. <laughs> but I've seen many times how someone is fired for not asking questions. <laughs> nice advice. Thanks. Okay, now my next question is about networking. How important has networking been in your journey? Do you have any specific strategy or tip for immigrants looking to establish meaningful connection in the new countries, Texan? Oh, I think networking is super important. And it is super important to have some sort of like a support group, right, that can sh with people, not maybe even people you work with in the same org together, but with people around you with whom you can share some ideas, use them as a sounding board, or use them whenever you need to, like from, for example, shift from job one to job two to ask for advice and so on. So I think networking is super important, but of course, when you move to a new country, you lose connections in your old one and it takes some time to build connections in new one and sometimes it feels even awkward to go to these networking events because you don't know anyone there but my advice would be to be brave and try it because that would be the best supporting mechanism you can get ever so try to figure out if you are software development what are the software development professional groups on linkedin on facebook whatever social network you prefer join start asking questions there make sure that there is a community that you can relate to and be active with this community i think uh here in helsinki we are really blessed because we have a really strong product management community uh, with a lot of people helping each other communicating with each other. We constantly give advice to one another and so on. And we also have this cool uh, international working women of Finland community, which is <laughs> amazing. And I really, really want to give a great credit to the founders of this community because it helped me a lot, especially in my first year, because you're moving to a new country. You don't know anything about legislation, labor legislation, things like that. Sometimes you feel awkward by the papers they ask you to sign and so on. And that was a perfect place to ask all these questions like, hey, can someone review my employment agreement and provide advice? Or do you know how accounting works? And so on. So thanks God we are living in this new era where we have a lot of social networks around us. Go there, try to join this community, try to see what issues are raised. It's also a really good way to evaluate if you want to move to, into this country or this city or whatever, just to check for yourself what people are discussing in all these communities. Yeah. How did you find uh, this uh, communities in the, in the beginning when you moved to Finland? Search. Like, really, <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing special. You just go on LinkedIn and like go there and for my for my job family it would be like product management helsinki right and then you mm -hmm. figure it out and then you can also ask your colleagues if they're mem like members or they engage with some other colleagues from other organizations what would be the platform that they use but just something to keep in mind that you need it and proactively looking for it i would say mm -hmm. don't wait till you see an advertisement or i don't know the email will come inviting you to some event look for these opportunities proactively yeah, that's true. 
Thank you. The next question is that, have you had any mentors or role models throughout your career who have particularly influenced your approach or perspective? How did you seek them out, especially in a new cultural setting? I think it is a bit harder to seek for those people in a new culture. The way you can do it is to try to follow a few influencers in your industry. And again, don't hesitate to approach people. The worst thing you can get uh, in response is no. In, in a good situation, they will reply and they will help you out. So I try to follow uh, webinars, public talks, and so on, and see who is there. And if something that this person presents resonates with me, and then approaching them on LinkedIn, saying like, hey, great presentation yesterday. What do you think about that? Let's discuss and so on. So I think that's the best way you can engage and find yourself the right mentor. Thank you. And the next question is about challenges. So what are specific challenges you face as an immigrant in tech world? Were there any things that you got surprised when you faced this challenge? Uh, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that. I think one of the challenges that I had was the uh, before I actually moved to Finland, I did realize how much do I need to invest into my social skills and into my emotional intelligence compared to the uh, situation when I was working in my native country. It's like you have your hard skills and you invest in your hard skills a lot, but then you need to develop your soft skills. And in your familiar environment, you usually develop them naturally, right? So like from the get-go, from the kindergarten, from your family, you learn what is a good approach, what is a bad approach, what is the right tone of voice, what is the wrong tone of voice in every situation. But then when you move into the international environment, you need to understand how to bring people on board. And those people might be coming from very different backgrounds. So we really need to figure out how to influence people, how to communicate with uh, people in a different way so that they can understand you. Because there is a lot of context that every communication has. And it's usually like something that is in the air when you're working in a country where you were born in. But when you move into another country, you need to learn it and you need to invest into it a lot. So I think one of the things people, uh, when I, for example, right now, give an advice and mentor people who want to move from their niche, uh, country of origin to the international uh, setup to move to some other country, they're asking me like, hey, I'm working as a director of product or director of engineering. Why don't they offer me the same position abroad? And the answer is that yes, as a director of engineering who used to work in the country of origin, you really probably have a strong skill set on the hard skill level, but you really need to learn how to communicate in a different mm. environment. And that's why you need to be prepared to maybe go like a couple of grades below your current level to kind of learn and pick up all these communicational skills that you would need for your further career progression. Mm. And that happened to me. So when I mm. moved to Finland, I moved to a linear product manager position, being head of product in my previous job. But I kind of did it consciously because I knew at that point in time that I would need some time to pick up all these social and communicational skills. Okay, that's interesting. So what did you do? Like, I want to know, like, if, in, did you take any courses? Did you start reading books or... You got a mentor that was helping you to improve your soft skill and communication skill. What was your approach? So I've been, I haven't been taking any courses and I basically, I don't know about any courses targeting specifically that problem. I uh, read a great book and if someone who is listening to us haven't done that yet, I highly recommend to do it. It's called Culture Map. So basically it's like, a really short book, really with really simple English, explaining how different cultures were formed in terms of communication, what is the difference between 
high, for example, cultures that appre appreciate hierarchy and cultures of consensus and how you need to deliver your message in different environments and so on. That's a great book. I really recommend that. And then like, yeah, maybe reach out to someone in your company who's been doing it for a long time. In my case, I was super, super lucky. My manager was my mentor and he helped a lot with my adaptation at that point in time. Okay, cool. So now checking some question from audience. Please ask Maria with regards to networking context and specifically in LinkedIn, what are the best approaches to create a good network? I think the best approach would be to start engaging with the people you feel relevant and important for you. I follow a lot of influencers, a lot of big names in the product management. I also try to give back to the community by sharing my learnings, sharing some updates from my career. And I think that's also important because, and sometimes people think that to share something on LinkedIn, you need to be an expert, I don't know, have a PhD or some sort of like worldwide recognition. That's not true. People might appreciate that you've learned an article and then you shared it so they don't need to spend time finding this article. Or you can post a summary of the conference that you attended. And it also might be a valuable piece of information for your network. So try to share with them and then also try to engage with people that you find relevant and again like don't be shy if you find that someone has uh, something to share with you or you want some feedback from this person just approach them tell them like hey great post last time like what do you think about that what do you think about this social networks are not just a top-down place where one person post content and the others read actually created for interaction and engagement so just don't be shy mm. yeah but i i guess like the main reason is the fear of rejection like for me also when i wanted to send you a message i was hesitating that you reject me and say no i will not come to your channel to discuss to have a session but yeah it needs it needs a lot of courage to overcome your fear of rejection to like proactively reach out to people and get involved. And so I guess like, especially when you're an immigrant, you, I guess this feeling, it will be doubled. You're always constantly worried that how other people will judge you, how they will look at you. And, but yeah, how, what, how do you suggest to like overcome this fear of rejection? Uh, I'll get back to my comment that I made a couple, maybe like 10 minutes ago, right? Like give people benefit of doubt that they're actually nice people and assume the right attention, right? Uh, so they might not answer you because they're busy. They might not answer you because they have other things to take care of. Mm. But in majority of the cases, they will not consider you a stupid person or not good enough for, for an answer. And uh, usually people appreciate, especially if they share something, people appreciate feedback. So if you have a constructive feedback, if you have something to say about what they've done and what they do, they usually answer. They answer more times than they, than they don't. You'll be surprised. Just give it a chance. Yeah, that's true. Okay. As a next question, as a woman in tech and a new country, what would be your advice for women aiming to thrive in the tech industry, especially when they are newcomer? And also, I was thinking, like, I see that you are really moving forward in the leadership position. So you have the courage to do that. I, I personally feel that it will take for me a longer time to be able to, like, ask for promotion or uh, get into the leadership role. Because, first of all, I'm afraid of a lot of already more. Uh, I just feel there are more competent people. Like, they are, the men, they are much better than me in the industry, in the tech industry, or maybe okay i need more time to learn more stuff and be ready to ask for a leadership position or for a senior position oh so there is, there is a lot to unbox in your question <laughs> so, uh let's start with what is my general advice to uh, uh women who uh want to strive in the tech industry and the general advice would be first be brave and second don't underestimate yourself 
they need you as much as you need them. Like tech industry really lacks women. And we know that innovation happens when people have different opinions that they can bring to the table, when people have different perspectives. If we just continue doing what we do, we will stick to our confirmation bias and we will continue repeating the same mistakes. There will be no chance for innovation. And it is known scientific fact that the more diversity the team has, the better team uh, innovates over time. So it's not you begging for a job, it's actually them being super, super, super motivated to hire someone like you so you can bring a new perspective to the team. And please, all, everyone, never be afraid and please value yourself. And I think the biggest problem that I see in women in tech is a lack of self-esteem. And mm -hmm. it comes from the fact that usually, unfortunately, due to cultural biases, we have all these problems with upbringing when women are uh, educated to be more agreeable, to be more humble and so on. But in reality, it's not that uh, you, uh, you're not suited for a job. You are. And you actually can bring a lot to the table that in other cases will not be there if they will not have you. And then like if we are talking about the leadership part, <laughs> that's actually the same thing because it's really like all these leadership cliches, they were framed over time in a way that suits uh, more like the male audience, right? And then like when you want to go there, you're like, yeah, but everyone around me is more suitable. Again, like the less <laughs> female leaders we have, the less chance we have to change this cliche a little bit towards all the skills that women can bring to the board. So again, it's not about like you asking for permission, but they actually need you there. So give them a chance to invite you to the table, I would say. Thank you so much. Okay, now a question from audience. Mortiza is asking, what strategies or advice do you have for professionals looking to thrive in remote working environments? Oh, this is this is a big topic. And I think that remote working environments have a lot of benefits, but at the same time have a lot of disadvantage for the efficiency and for your career progression. A lot is getting lost in the translation when you're working in a remote setup because obviously you don't have this same space which you physically share with your colleagues. That means that you need to over communicate. And that you, means that you also need to double check what was the reaction to the message that you sent, right? It's like, if I'm talking to you right now, you hear my voice, you hear my tone of voice, you hear that, I hope you hear that I'm quite relaxed and friendly, but let's say I'm typing it all is a Slack message and then someone reads it and they have their own <laughs> voice in their head and they can read the same message with a very angry voice or with a very friendly voice. And that like would be a, that will result in a different perception of this message in the end of the day. So if you are working in a remote environment, you need to make sure that you are actually understood and not misunderstood. And that's all in all your job. So over communicate, make sure that you jump on a call, maybe on an extra call with your supervisor, with your teammate, with your stakeholder, just to clarify that everything is clear and people understand one another. I think when we just, when the pandemic just started, I kind of like one, the one day I spent 12 hours on the calls. I was insane and my throat <laughs> was hurting afterwards. But that was because I was really hoping to figure out like if everyone understands me, if everyone is on the same page. And make sure that you find uh, some informal ways to engage with your team as well. Like, I don't know, organize a pet friendly chat where everyone posts pictures of their pets or memes. It's really important that people don't see you as a like small uh, circle in their Slack <laughs> or in, in whatever uh, call calls the uh, solution they use like Zoom or Meets or whatever. Mm -hmm. try, to, try to engage with them, try to share a little bit about yourself because it also helps to streamline the communication moving forward. Thank you so much. The next question from SJ. 
what is an eye-catching resume? Can you give us the main characteristics of the Wiener resume? And what makes a resume more valuable in comparison to others? How much is the effect of ATS? I don't know what is ATS. So if you can leave an extra comment in the chat, that would be super cool. But I can comment uh, uh, on the resume part and CV part. I think the eye catching one should be tailored for the specific job posting. And there are like two ways of companies right now to process uh, resumes. One would be automatic one when they just scan with the keywords, right? So for that one, you need to make sure that all the right keywords are in place. And then the other one, when human actually reads your uh, CV, and then you need to figure out what would be the best way to deliver the message about your experience. And as a person who reads a lot of resumes, like really, I think I've scammed through 100 in the last months, I have few asks towards the audience. First, when you uh, list your company, companies in experience list, make sure that you describe a company. If you haven't been working for Amazon, Meta, Google, people usually don't know what blah, blah .com does. So it, it's super important before even you before you start to describe your skills to describe the company you worked for. And then when you go into the description of your skills, unless you're a super junior person just out of the university, it is more important to describe the projects you've been in than the specific, uh, specific programming language or the specific tool that you know. It's like, I've been a front-end engineer who delivered this complex front-end for the reporting tool. That speaks a lot and speaks a lot more than I've been a front-end engineer who knows React, Angular, and then we can uh, continue the list of abbreviations. So introduce yourself a little bit from a professional standpoint, like in a human speaking language. That would be for me a secret of an eye catching resume. Cool. Awesome. Applicant and... tracking systems. Yeah. So basically yeah. it's automated systems. For yeah. This is like, I think we have a tech uh, audience here. So those are algorithmics, algorithmic systems, right? So basically yeah. you put some parameters in and then it uh, scans LinkedIn yeah. or the environments. And then like, if you know that the company that you are interested in will use such a tracking system, Mm. Check out what would be the way that they frame the job postings on their site and try to match the wording of these postings in your CV. And that will probably increase your chance of getting noticed by these automation tracking systems. But be prepared once they answer to you and say, like, hey, we are interested to come up with a little bit more like tailored and uh, you like tailored for humans version of your CV, I would say, because it's, it's extremely hard to navigate through those if you are not an automated system, if, like the ones that only list all these key skills and abbreviations and things like that. Thank you. And how about the interview? When someone like uh, come to interview, what really uh, keep you inspired about the candidate? What are you looking for the, in this person? to see if it is a right match for this position or not? It really depends on the position. It's it's really different, I would say. Uh, from the uh, soft skill standpoint, I would say it's really important to introduce yourself and to explain a little bit about your background, where you're coming from, what you're looking for. Because what is hard to read in all these calls that we now have instead of like, in-person interviews and what is the motivation like why do you want to apply for this job why do you want to be there so don't forget to talk a little bit about the company do your homework check the website what have they done what they have for example released in the recent couple of months just to form this personal touch with an interviewer because uh, otherwise you come up as a very skillful person but nobody gets why do they need to hire you and not the other skillful person it's really important to show some motivation and some understanding of the industry and of the company you're interviewing with. Thank you. Okay, so 
do you want to sh do you have any things in your mind that you want to share or should i keep asking my question <laughs> <laughs> an audience question as well i think yeah i i probably should continue answering questions i would say <laughs> Okay, cool. So, yeah, the next question is that are there any particular habits, routine or mindset you have adopted that you believe uh, it has played a significant role in your success? Mm. It's a really good question and again requires a lot of self-reflection. I don't think that I have a ready-made recipe. I am a very result-oriented person. So for me, it's important that something that I do changes something in reality for the business. And I am very metrics motivated, uh, motivated and oriented person. I'm a number person in a way. And I think that helps a lot when you're jumping on a project to understand what would be the purpose of this project and how this project can deliver value for the business. Because sometimes people focus a lot on these like ideas and vision and how they can uh, uh, become a visionary in something. That's a really common approach in product management, for example. But then uh, if you cannot connect vision with the business and you cannot explain to your company how you drive this business, that might not result in the best result, uh, best results for you and for the company. It's like I, I read like maybe... 15 years ago, an advice in some book that, hey, if you don't want to be laid off, figure out what company will lose if they lay you off. And this is the way I try to approach my personal career choices. Like, where should I work? What would be the overall value of the project that I'm currently working with for the company? And if they will ever be challenged with this uh, problem of laying people off, would they lay off people from my division or from the division next to me? So how essential for the business is what I do. And I'm trying to work where it's essential for the business. Okay. And question from Mac. How can we make sure that as a tech engineer, we do have a good impact on the product and company? I think that it's, again, like, figuring out not just the engineering challenge but the business challenge behind it so what exactly and i actually i personally love to work with with engineers who challenge me on the business side a lot so sometimes when you just give a task to a person and they execute that's a boring way of doing things right and i think for engineers it's essential to understand the problem the underlying business and customer problem and if you make an effort to learn it, you might come up with a better solution than the one that you've been given top down by your engineering manager or product manager and propose how you can optimize that. And I think that it's really important. And I would advise to challenge your product people on that, whoever you're working with, product owner, product manager, to explain to you what is a customer problem and what is a business challenge all the time while you're working on a task. Thank you so much. Okay, and I also would like to know, are there any specific areas you're eager to explore or challenges you're looking forward to taking on? I just took on a big challenge. I switched from one industry where I was super familiar with everything because I've been working in this industry for more than seven years to another where I have a very limited knowledge of what's going on. And I think that actually, like you asked me a couple of questions uh, before, what would be the way to progress in your career? And this is more like a job family specific advice that I give a lot to product managers. Try to apply your skills in different environments from time to time. Challenge yourself to jump from consumer applications to business to business SaaS and so on, because that helps you to uh, accumulate a lot of knowledge and a lot of different ways how you can practice same things in the different environments and that's really important for the professional development it's like i like this metaphor of lego so let's say you only have one lego set and it's all about pirates and you really know how to play lego and can put together all these pirate ships but that's very very boring if you're playing this only pirate ship lego for for the 
throughout your life, right? And then yeah. at some point you want to figure out how to build something different, like a police station or, I don't know, a shop, a supermarket and so on. So in the career, it's the same, right? If you're only working with one framework as a developer, with one product as a product manager, it becomes that you're kind of like you know only one trick. And the more tricks you learn, the more valuable you are as a professional because you can figure out how to pick up something from here, something from there, and come up with something new, some unique approach to solving a particular business challenge and a problem. And yeah, so in my case, the specific area that I'm exploring right now is green energy and green technology. And I'm hoping to learn more and more about that and see how the knowledge that I have about data, data pipelines, uh, machine learning and things like that could be applied in this industry. Mm -hmm. But Maria, I was thinking like if we try to jump from, for example, one industry to another industry, so we will never be expert in one domain. So this is what I'm always afraid that as a product person that, okay, if I just stick, for example, to one industry and I be expert in this domain, then I will be like an outstanding candidate if I want to move and change the job. I think it's it depends on the cadence, right? So if you probably mm. jump from one industry to another industry every year, you will not have enough time to form the in-depth understanding of an industry. But let's say if you worked on in one industry for five years and then you moved, it's it's a bit of a different story, right? And it's not just industry that provides you all this like expert knowledge, right? It's also the, for example, the size of a company. So if you're working in a really big company and you know how to navigate through all these layers of hierarchy and politics and so on, you might be successful in a big company in a different industry as well because you just know all these like operation, operating models of this. And then, yeah, and then for example, again, like if you've been working in a scale up or a startup and you've seen this hyper growth curve and how people... Uh, what what sort of challenges do you have when you have a hyper growth curve? Then you probably can bring some expertise, some knowledge, and some experience from that previous job to the next one. So it's not just about industry. You can look at it from different perspective in the multiple like, on the multiple scales. I would say. Yeah, that's true. Are you afraid of AI? Do you no. think that AI will replace us? <laughs> AI will help us. I don't think AI will ever replace us. And the thing is that, yeah, at some point in time in my career, I've been working in a search engine and I remember talks about AI replacing humans and taking jobs from humans from like probably year 2010. And look, we are in the year 2020 <laughs> and we're still talking about this. So I don't think it will ever happen like in a way that AI will take all our jobs. But of course, there are some aspects and there are some, I would say, specific job families that are more in danger because of AI, AI and because of the large linguistic models, for example. I think that one of the good examples would be the whole translating and this use case. Of course, I personally enjoy working with uh, large linguistic models and they help me a lot with copy, with text editing and things like that. And I think that's actually a huge benefit for international talent. If English is not your first language, you sometimes have a really hard time figuring out how to frame your message, how to frame your email or whatever you're writing in the right way. And now you have this amazing assistant who can actually help you to distill the right message from what you're writing and make sure that it's clear for everyone. So I would say I, I I rather appreciate for now what AI has to offer than I'm afraid of it. But of course, if you are working like on a very, very tedious task, tedious, repetitive task, that's a task that is super easy to automate. But as soon as we are talking about something creative, when you need to come up with something new, with a new approach, with uh, some creative way of solving the problem, then I think that that would be left for humans to solve for for the foreseeable future <laughs> hopefully okay question from max do you like to work in a big product and a big company where you probably are focused on a small part or to work in a smaller company but your role will be more notable i've been 
actually jumping from one to the other a couple of times throughout my career. Currently, I feel uh, more and I'm leaning towards smaller companies because, I th as I said, like I'm this person who really wants to see this measurement and this number that they can change with their efforts. And it's easier to achieve something like that in a smaller company. Uh, in a bigger company, you are usually working on a smaller scope, on a narrower scope. And then, of course, it's harder to estimate your impact towards overall like PNL or balance sheet of the business. But at the same time, what is great about big companies is that you have tremendous learning opportunities and you have a community within the company that can support you. When I was working at Zalanda, there, I was working there together with 250 product managers. So wow. it's, 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 it's a big community and a lot of great people who can give you an advice, who you can uh, reach out to to talk about something when you're even in trouble. So I would say that it's not like either or, and I would advise that throughout your career you try both because you can get a lot for your personal development from both sides. Thank you. Next question. In... An ever-evolving tech landscape, how do you ensure you stay updated and continuously up skill? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good one. And yeah, I, I, I remember myself when I was out of the university, uh, I was getting my PhD and I was like, yeah, now I'm done. I will <laughs> never be uh, reading for an exam ever in my life again. And look where we are right now, where all the skills are getting, uh, like old in a year and we constantly need to read we constantly need to look what's changing in the industry take courses <laughs> read for exams get certifications and I think that right now we are living in a world if you really don't want AI to take your job you need to study all the time throughout all your career so how to stay updated look out for industry leaders look out for opinion leaders in your industry see what they are talking about if you feel that you don't understand use these things that you don't understand as a search terms and try to figure out if you can learn it i think that we are now living in a world where we need to study continuously thank you so much if you could Go back in a time when you first moved to Finland. What advice would you give yourself? Mm, yeah, it's a very specific, and I will make a joke about uh, <laughs> Finland and how people communicate here. But if you are living here in Helsinki and if you're, you've been in Finland for a long time, you know that people are not super talkative and not super open. In my case, it has been the case that the team I was working with, they haven't talked to one another for days. They were communicating over a messenger that we used for work and then like nothing happened. And uh, to me, it felt like a super unfriendly environment. Like why no one is having a chat with me? Why there is no nothing like a small talk? So if I would... <laughs> go back in time i would say to myself it's not like it's not a problem they're not uh evil people they're actually super friendly it's just the way they communicate really learn the ways people in this new culture communicate with one another and by the way you're smiling i feel like you can relate to that. <laughs> yeah i guess it's it's very difficult for like extrovert people and like, like myself as well, like as a social person, I was, I always want to talk with people and I, I always felt that they are skeptical in the beginning. So they don't like to like get so friendly at the beginning and it takes time and I'm not a patient person. So I was always in rush to make friends and be friendly with everyone. Yeah, I, I really understand. Yeah. And, 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 re and, re and in reality, it just like it takes more time here, right? So in in yeah. three months, in a couple of months, usually everyone starts to become more friendly. They get used to you, and you can actually form a really, really in-depth, meaningful connection. But it just takes time, and it's not something that you know from the get-go. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I, I learned that I shouldn't take anything personally here. So it's not about me. <laughs> so it's about just the culture difference. Yeah, yeah, always assume the best intention, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, another question again from Max. So how do you handle conflicts between engineer managers and stakeholders? I think that conflict is unavoidable. The question is, is it a healthy conflict or unhealthy conflict? People have different perspectives on some matters. And as I said, I believe that true, true strong innovation happens only when you can bring all these different perspectives to the table. What's important is that people can share their opinions openly and everyone is given a chance to speak. And the other part is that I'm really strong, a strong believer of this approach, which is called disagree and commit. So it might sometimes be the case that someone is not super happy with the strategy or tactics that team decides to pursue, but you need to be your team biggest fan and still follow what they decided to do. And this is something that I constantly remind people that, hey, yeah, you might not be super happy with the approach that we have chosen, but we will be more successful as a team if everyone supports it for the time being. And then we can figure out when we need to pivot. And the one thing that I already mentioned about the pink elephant, sometimes you can resolve the conflict by just asking people to write down what they think in the same doc. So, hey, we are discussing it for the second hour in a row. Let's just write it down and read it through. And sometimes when people write things down, everything becomes more obvious because they just spend some more time like framing it, formulating it. And then it's very, very obvious what sort of a decision should be taken. Thank you. Okay. And my next question is your advice for tech companies looking to hire more diverse talents, including immigrants. What advice would you give them to ensure an inclusive environment? Make sure that you, when you interview people, you actually somehow try to understand where people are coming from and uh, why they might feel not that confident in an interview or sometimes when people get anxious they get overconfident that would be like the other side but always give a little bit like put a little bit of effort into it it's easier to read people when they're coming from a familiar environment and from the familiar culture and it's harder to read people from the foreign environment so it takes a bit of effort from a hiring manager. It takes a bit of effort to, from HR to understand. As I said, for example, if I'm now working in Finland for five years, of course, I know all the big Finnish scale-ups, all the big Finnish startups, what's trendy, what's the big company. But if I wasn't here, I wouldn't probably know if a person comes from a well-established company or from something new and so on. And it takes more effort to evaluate international talent. But I think the perspective and the learning that international talent can bring to the table is super valuable, so it worth this effort. Thank you so much. So now as we wrap up this insightful session, I want to ask my last question. What is one piece of advice or message you'd like to leave uh, with our audience? They are basically tech immigrants. And so there are those who are just starting or wanting to further their journey in the tech world. And they will be our fu the future immigrants. What advice do you have for them? Uh, as we already discussed, I think you should be brave. I think you should try. It might be that you are misunderstood and that you're not give, getting a response that you were looking for from the environment immediately. It's just about finding the right company, the right manager, and the right team for you. So it might take longer than it would be for the your, when you're looking for a job in your country of origin. Don't give up. You are super valuable, and people need you, and you can bring an amazing learnings and amazing perspective to the table when you join the, the company. That was great. 
Thank you so much, Maria, for your time. It was very insightful session. I really enjoyed talking to you. If uh, anyone wants to be in touch with you, they can reach you through uh, via LinkedIn. Yes, yes, yes. If I don't answer immediately, that's because I have my 12 meetings in the, in the day, but <laughs> I'll make sure that <laughs> if I can help, I'll help. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, as a last question, audience are asking for books or podcasts, if you have any suggestion, any general podcast or books that you you like to read or listen. Uh, podcasts I listen to are mainly like professional podcasts. Lenny's and Melissa Perry would be the ones that I would advise to product managers. From book perspective, if you want to read one book, I would suggest to read Kahneman Thinking Fast and Slow because it explains a lot about how people work with information, how they perceive the information, and how they make decisions. And I think the knowledge that this book delivers is super valuable. It doesn't matter which top family you're from and where you're working. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining this session and sharing your question. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Hope we haven't, I didn't bore you too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a very fun session. Thank you so much, Maria. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.